Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. This is episode 37. Today the guys and I work to catch up on the last month or so of important headlines. We include recent news about after effects from the Vietnam War, the recent Supreme Court decision banning transgender service members from being recruited, a few national security points on fallout from the government shutdown, the recent capture of an Indian pilot by Pakistani forces, and the substandard military housing investigation that is currently being conducted by several committees in Congress. When I made it to my home place, I found triumph of the will, where once lay a shining city Stood a fortress on a hill I'm Henry. This is Fortress on a Hill. Thank you for joining us. For those new to the podcast, BT, Danny, and I are three leftist combat veterans who take the military and veteran stories of the day and provide some much-needed historical context and examination. All right, so I want to I want to take a minute here. I'm going to run through a, a bunch of headlines today, catch everybody up on some little tidbits of things I've been keeping track of. I want to start first with um, with the Vietnam War, and in studying the effects of our military policy, anti-war activists need to understand that the, the job is never done. There are so many layers to how a country or its people respond to foreign invasion and occupation, um, which is exactly what the United States has done to uh, many countries many times. For those who got to hear the last episode, I had some very explicit things to say about The Long Road Home, the National Geographic um, series on a specific war in the Iraq War, and how many lines in the series referred to the occupation of Iraq as a, quote, peacekeeping mission. Of course, I'm thinking of the destruction of Vietnamese foliage and soil through Agent Orange exposure, along with the diseases and sterility it caused in the population. I'm thinking of chloral stricken kids in Yemen, where the local sewage infrastructure has been destroyed by bombing runs. I'm thinking of Iraqis who were forced to breathe nasty fumes from our bases burning garbage, or from where soils gotten contaminated by shells made from depleted uranium. And these are two other headlines that I'd like to add to that pile. But first, a, a little history and something I didn't know until recently. When we fought in Vietnam, South Korea came to our aid. There were approximately 320,000 South Korean soldiers sent to Vietnam between 1964 and 1973. And during their occupation of Vietnam alongside ours, South Korean soldiers raped Vietnamese women in large numbers. In the show notes, I linked to a, a Reuters article that descri- describes a woman named Tran Thai uh, Nagai, who was repeatedly raped by multiple South Korean soldiers. All right, I got a little clip here to share with you guys. Since President Trump came into office, he has made clear his desire to restrict immigration. His administration has severely limited refugee admissions. It has banned travel from several mainly Muslim countries and detained and deported Central American asylum seekers. Now the administration wants to send back some members of another group that was assumed to be protected from deportation, Vietnamese people who came here in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. The administration first raised this idea last year, then dropped it. Now, though, the Department of Homeland Security says it does want to deport 7,000 convicted criminals, non-U.S. citizens, back to Vietnam. When the proposal first came up, the U.S. ambassador to Vietnam resigned in protest. That former diplomat, Ted Osius, is with us now by phone from Ho Chi Minh City. Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure, Michelle. Thank you. So could you just briefly remind us of when this particular group of people came to the United States and under what circumstances? I'm thinking here, some people may be old enough to remember the these pictures of sort of desperate people trying to flee on these rickety boats after the South fell to the communists. So just remind us of that history. Yeah, well, most came between 1975 and 1995. Saigon fell in 75. There were a lot of boat people who 
left Vietnam at that time and came to the United States. And we were the place of refuge for people who'd fought side by side with us during the war, in many cases, the children of American servicemen, but for the most part, people who were fleeing the regime that had unified Vietnam. And what was the immigration status of these refugees? Well, a lot of them eventually were able to get green cards. Some didn't get green cards because they got messed up with the law or they didn't speak English well enough to get through the process. Some became American citizens, but some did not. And it's the ones who did not become American citizens who seem to be at risk. Mm. So the Trump administration says that this group of people... So that's a, a clip that I'll include with the with the episode. I need to cut it down to be more specific. I just wanted to give you guys a, a little taste of it. Um, Tran bore three children from her sexual assaults, along with being imprisoned by Vietnamese authorities and accused of, quote, sleeping with the enemy. She described one of her rapists a, as a man in his full South Korean army uniform, in addition to him being armed at the time. She said she was terrified for her life. But it didn't end there. The next two South Korean soldiers made it an ongoing horror that Tran had to suffer through, repeatedly raping her over a period of years. Tran and her children were ostracized from her community in Fujian province in central Vietnam, being seen as having consorted with the enemy. This has also happened to Vietnamese children fathered by American troops who were deployed to Vietnam. And Tran is just one of many women who have suffered like this. It's a curious situation that um, South Korea, in hot pursuit of justice for the suffering that their citizens endured at the hands of the Japanese army during World War II, it's interesting that they've denied giving that same relief um, to the people of Vietnam. Japan, for its part, has claimed that the 1965 treaty restoring diplomatic ties with South Korea settled all wartime compensation claims. However, activists claim that Japan's apologies have not gone far enough, with South Korean courts declaring that both the treaty and a separate $9 million agreement that funded a foundation for South Korean sexual slavery victims do not prevent victims from seeking reparations from Japan. Now, the second part of this is very much about our president. We allowed a lot, large number of Vietnamese refugees to come here after the war. Translators, people who were in local government, anyone whose life was threatened because they decided to side with us. The Trump administration is working hard to rescind an agreement between the U.S. and Vietnam from 1995 that exempted any refugees from deportation if they were in the U.S. prior to July 12, 1995 the day the U.S. and Vietnam formally reestablished diplomatic relations. It's important to note the tens of thousands of people who came here after the war. And while the Trump administration has mainly wanted to evict those with criminal records, they may find a way to send back non-criminal Vietnamese immigrants. There are people like Tran who have been cut off from ordinary parts of Vietnamese society because they're seen as attached to the American invaders. For the moment, deportations are at a standstill as Vietnam must take back any refugees the U.S. evicts, something Vietnam has so far refused to do. There's someone else I want to mention with this story, and the power of her recent actions is, is really moving to me. Last October, a woman named Nadia Murad became the first Nobel Peace Prize winner from Iraq. She is a Yazidi activist who was held as a sex slave by ISIS forces, along with about 7,000 other women like her in Iraq. She spoke out specifically in support of Vietnamese victims like Tran, who were harmed by South Korean forces, quote, as these criminals enjoy more rights, freedom and life than the victims themselves, how can we restore dignity to the victims if everyone turns a blind eye to the prosecution of perpetrators and allows them to enjoy impunity? I call upon the international community to hold its responsibilities to protect women from sexual violence in conflict zones. So my last, my last little note on this, there's a Vietnamese term for the children of people like Tran, whose parentage involved South Korean fathers. 
it's considered highly derogatory. The, the term is Lede Han. I've included a link in the show notes to an organization called Justice for Lede Han, which specifically advocates for Vietnamese victims of sex crimes perpetrated by the U.S. and Allied forces. You know, one of the things about the Vietnam War is it, it never really ended, as you know, in the American collective consciousness and in the Vietnamese and Asian collective consciousness. You know, whether it's Agent Orange affecting our troops, which we've talked about before on the pod, um, or or these, these children um, born of American or South Vietnamese or South Korean fathers, um, or whether it just be the resentments that continue in Asia. I mean, the Vietnam War is ongoing. It casts a shadow over everything we do. A lot of people don't know what you mentioned, which is that South Korea sent many thousands of troops to fight in Vietnam on, on our behalf. And in fact, in many cases, the South Koreans were considered some of the most brutal soldiers that the Viet Cong, our uh, purported enemies, were afraid of. Um, they often uh, acted outside of international human rights law. Um, the rapings were, were one sort of symptom of this, but there were instances where South Korean soldiers were sent to some of the most dangerous areas or areas where um, the United States commanders felt that a heavy hand was needed, but that American troops would come under too much media scrutiny in the increasingly anti-war American political landscape. And so therefore, um, you know, the South Koreans were put there. The only reason South Korea would agree to send soldiers to Vietnam is not because South Korea had any inherent interest in Vietnam being communist or non-communist, but rather because they were counting on the United States to maintain a security backing for them against China and the North Koreans. So this is a way in which American alliance systems actually end up dragging other players into wars that really aren't their fight. Uh, but they feel obligated to do so under the umbrella of American security guarantees. Yeah, it was, uh, it is a really curious thing, Danny, to watch that dynamic, that how, how would conflicts have worked out if the U.S. or others didn't have certain allies, didn't have certain assets? You know, the, the, the alliances that Venezuela has right now are the only things that's keeping us from doing much more brutal regime change there because Russia and China and others are actually doing things for them. Otherwise, it, it, it just wouldn't, wouldn't happen. But um, I think that the, the biggest thing, the biggest reason I wanted to mention this is that in terms of understanding, you know, with all the variety of ways that we damage Vietnam, we damage the soil through Agent Orange, and, and in that way, we dam they, they damage the people. The addition of our, you know, the rapes and assaults on Vietnamese people, Vietnamese women over a de an almost decade-long war. These are common things that happen in almost every war. They're not, they're, I wouldn't say they're universal, but they're definitely common. And so when we look back at our wars, we need to understand that we left a footprint in the ground wherever we were, in blood, and in probably a lot of other nasty things. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was New Mexico that just signed a lawsuit against, I don't know if it's a branch specifically or just DOD wholesale uh, for pollution on the, uh, on the state for um, looking at potential super fun sites of these mil former military installations that have all of these uh, chemicals have leached into the, the water supply or into the soil or radiation or whatnot. And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about it later with the housing, but we just see that when it comes to setting up and establishing anything that's in the military, it doesn't seem that it's ever put into the highest regard as far as what are we doing to the environment? What are we doing to the health of the people that are those that are around us? And I mean, it just, it says something if you look at how we treat our own people in our own country, you know, it, it leaves very little to the imagination of how we're gonna treat somebody that we view as an enemy or, you know, whatever, whatever filter uh, somebody wants to put on whoever we're 
told to look at negatively. I think it's instructive that the recent botched U.S. North Korea summit was held in Vietnam. Um, obviously, the United States wanted to send a message to North Korea, which is, look, this country, Vietnam, used to be our enemy, but now it is our tacit ally in the region against China. And also, this you know, formerly closed socialist economic system of Vietnam has of late over the last two decades kind of opened up itself to capitalism, at least in its cities and at least along its coastline. And, and, and hopefully North Korea will take a lesson from these two things. Now, I don't think that Kim Jong-un took that lesson. Uh, no. I don't think he looks at Vietnam and says, I want to be just like Vietnam. I want to open myself to the world and I want to, you know, loosen the reins of power. I think he looks at Vietnam and says one thing and one thing alone, which is this is a country that the United States, small countries like North Korea, if they hold out and if they refuse to quit, can beat the United States in a protracted conflict. So I think that's the lesson that Kim uh, takes from the Vietnam locale for these uh, these summits, rather than the one that the U.S. State Department and, you know, presumably the Trump administration wants them to take. And so in that way, Vietnam does continue to cast a shadow on American dealings in Asia. As, as it should. I think that that's a, I mean, it's, it's a horrifying thing, but at least our history is more, more well known these days. Absolutely. So as we shift west, a bit. I think we have to talk briefly about India, Pakistan, and the recent uptick in uh, in violence and threats between these two nuclear armed powers. It's a big deal, you know. Um, American political discourse, mainstream media has been obsessed with Venezuela of late in foreign affairs, and Michael Cohen and the Trump soap opera in domestic affairs. Right. This is the story. And they're important stories. But what gets lost is the fact that two nuclear armed nations came to the brink of war over the last couple of weeks. And I'm going to hypothesize that actually when it comes to the things that should keep policymakers up at night, that should keep American foreign policy experts up at night, there is perhaps no country more than Pakistan which should worry us. Okay. Pakistan, an incredibly fragile semi-democracy with uh, a few hundred nuclear weapons and an enormous Islamist uh, movement or undercurrent that's growing within itself, especially within the military and intelligence communities. So Pakistan meets up at night, right? The possibility of a coup in Pakistan perpetrated by Islamist military officers or the possibility of state fracture under the weight of civil war or insurgency, uh, or even just in the sense of sharing nuclear secrets potentially from Pakistan to groups like Al Qaeda or the Islamic State or whoever the next iteration is. But so these are the things we should be really worried about. Okay, I would argue that American Pakistan policy has a uh, has been opaque. It has been muddled, uh, and it, sometimes it's actually been contradictory. But let's look at what happened with uh, India and Pakistan. Okay, first of all, a little small history lesson is required. And the takeaway from this history lesson is the same as, uh, Henry, you know, the takeaway of every history lesson, which is the British fucked the world up uh, long ago, <laughs> everywhere. So in the, uh, the United Kingdom uh, ruled India in a, in a relatively direct form from uh, the mid-18th uh, century uh, all the way up until about 1947, okay? And what we now know as India, Pakistan, Burma, and Bangladesh all used to be rolled under one, uh, you know, imperial government, which was in India, okay? So this was all considered India. Um, after independence is granted, okay, this is after Gandhi's non, you know, nonviolent, protest movement, uh, there were some violent organizations within India. When the British agree to leave economically and politically bankrupt in 1947, the, the goal of both the British and of Gandhi and his movement was to keep uh, at least 
the three main parts of the Indian subcontinent, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India, together as one country. But uh, especially the Muslim minority, um, which was a sizable minority, decided that they wanted an, an independent state for Muslims, which was called Pakistan. And of course, at the start of its independence in 1947, Pakistan actually includes Pakistan today and Bangladesh. Okay, It's not until the mid-1960s, early 1970s, when uh, a war breaks out in Bangladesh and Bangladesh gets its independence from Pakistan. Well, here's the deal. Um, hundreds of thousands, uh, and in fact, millions of Indians and Pakistanis, Muslims and Hindus, uh, were moved either forcibly or voluntarily uh, from one country to the other, okay, in order to make uh, Pakistan more homogeneously Muslim and India slightly more homogeneously Hindu. And there was a lot of violence when the British left, because the British like to leave a shit sandwich and the locals just kill it out of themselves. And it really was a mess. Since then, India and Pakistan have been mortal enemies. They fought four wars, okay, four outright shooting wars, and they've remained at war in a, in a low-level sort of proxy setting in the northern mountainous disputed provinces of Jammu and Kashmir. Okay, Kashmir being the more uh, well-known province. Okay, so both countries claim that they should rule Kashmir, and they have very different reasons for why. The Pakistanis think they should rule it because Kashmir is uh, majority Muslim, okay? And therefore, their presumption is that if they were allowed to vote, they would vote to become part of Pakistan, and that may be true. The Indians, on the other hand, say, hey, no, this was granted to us in the partition treaty. And, oh, by the way, we don't care that Kashmir is majority Muslim because we have lots of Muslims, hundreds of millions of Muslims in India, and we are a multinational, uh, diverse, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society, and it's important to us to remain that way. Okay, so they're at, they're at a loggerheads over Kashmir. Pakistan tends to support, fund, and uh, provide safe haven for various insurgent or terrorist groups in Kashmir, depending on your viewpoint. So this latest uh, escalation between the two countries was really uh, brought about by about 40 Indian paramilitary soldiers being uh, killed in a bombing by a uh, Kashmiri uh, insurgent who was probably supported and perhaps even uh, given safe haven in Pakistan. So India, for the first time in four decades, bombs Pakistani territory, okay, sends, sends uh, fighter bombers over. And two of them get shot down, and one pilot is actually captured by the Pakistanis. Look, this is all a big deal because in the mid-1990s, India and Pakistan both developed nuclear weapons. And you can guess where they're pointed. They're pointed right at each other. India has the stronger economy, the larger economy, and the larger army. Uh, but their nuclear deterrents are, are about equal. Okay, they're about equal. They could both destroy the other pretty well. And this is scary. Um, and it's strange for the United States because the United States is tacitly allied with both of these countries. I mean, don't get me wrong. Pakistan is the ultimate frenemy. You know, lump them in with Israel and Saudi Arabia as our greatest frenemies. You know, Pakistan, out of one side of their mouth, says they support us and they support the war on terror. And out of the other side of their mouth, they give safe haven to Osama bin Laden for over 10 years, you know, so or for about 10 years. This, this is this is a problematic country. And, and, and the Pakistan is, is still the home of the Taliban and, and all the Taliban guys that come over seasonally into Kandahar province and killed my soldiers, we know where they wintered. They wintered in Pakistan safely without much, you know, without much pressure from the Pakistani government. So Pakistan is, is a country that we have a very paradoxical relationship with. Um, it's a very cynical relationship between Washington and Islamabad or uh, the United States and Pakistan, put another way. India is interesting because they are also uh, a notional American partner. We have a nuclear agreement with them, a nuclear uh, power sharing agreement with India. And we're really hoping that India, with its growing population and its growing economy, will serve as a counterweight to China in the future, to a growing Chinese military and economic behemoth. Well, here's what we found out uh, in this latest episode of the fighters being shot down. India's military is, like, pretty fucked up. It leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, it's larger than Pakistan. The economy is growing. But India's military has a lot of antique equipment. 
okay? Um, a lot of legacy equipment, a lot of problems with the uh, over-centralization of bureaucracy, and it's not clear that anytime soon India is going to be able to militarily balance China. That just seems unlikely. And my final point on these two countries and why we should give a shit, okay? This all goes under the category of, Danny, why should we care about India and Pakistan? Well, here's one reason, as if the others weren't important enough. These are both fragile states. Now, Pakistan is a utterly fragile democracy. Okay, They've never really had more than a decade and a half of civilian rule. They've had numerous military coups and uh, takeovers of the military of government. And, and it's, it's possible that could happen again. And that's problematic because the military, which used to be a secular institution, has become infested of late during the war on terror years with Islamist-inspired military officers. Okay? And the intelligence uh, organization, the ISI, their CIA, is littered with Islamists who support the Taliban and sometimes support al-Qaeda. So uh, Pakistan is, is, is a country that's barely holding on to its nascent democratic civilian-led government. And at any moment that could fall. And conflict with India is only more likely to empower the military and therefore endanger U.S. interests. Uh, to say nothing of the nuclear fallout of an exchange of thermonuclear weapons between these two countries. I mean, they could they could set off a war that destroys the planet. I mean, that that's that's always uh, uh, probably the primary issue. Now, H India doesn't have a history of military coups, and India is in fact the largest or the most populated democracy in the world. Something they're very proud of, but they're pretty fragile too. There's a lot of corruption. There's a lot of poverty. And they're ruled by Narendra Modi, who heads up a wildly right-wing, chauvinistic Hindu nationalist party. And again, you know, we look on with caution and some concern as that power, uh, as the power of the BHP, which is, I believe, the name of the party, uh, increases. And so what do we know about war? What do we know about military conflict? It tends to empower nefarious actors in both societies, which in the case of India and Pakistan could mean further empowered Modi and his right-wing Hindus and a further empowerment of the Pakistani military and their influential Islamist officers. So, so that's the backstory. It looks like tensions are cooling. Uh, Pakistan handed over the, the uh, Indian pilot, but what I would say, guys, is keep watching this conflict and don't sleep on Pakistan because it's what keeps me up at night. Yeah, I think in all the headlines I've gone through recently, of the dozens and dozens and dozens I've seen about Venezuela, I've seen, I think, two that were on India and Pakistan on, what, on the, the fighter getting captured and the fallout from that. Yeah, uh, it's scary. Yeah, I've seen one. Yeah. The American people don't know what to be afraid of. I mean, they don't. I mean, they're told by our president to be, and I can say this shit now that I'm retired officially as of February 11th, <laughs> uh, my first post-retirement show. Uh, hey, look, the American people are so inundated by, you know, threats and, and told what they should be scared of. They should be scared of Mexicans. They should be scared of black people, that, you know, and gun violence in Chicago. They should be scared of North Korea. They should be scared of Muslims. You know, I mean, there's so many, like, so much fear mongering coming out of the Trump administration that we, we forget sometimes that there are genuine threats in the world. There are things we should be worried about. But we're so busy with the Trump soap opera or whatever the latest shiny object that Mr. Trump and his administration have us focused on worldwide, we forget the fact that, look, Pakistan is a, a highly problematic nuclear-armed country that has really been a frenemy across three administrations, at least, that being George W. Bush, Obama, and Trump. So this isn't a new issue, but it's a really scary one. Danny, do you recall how our policy towards Pakistan changed after we captured Osama bin Laden? You know, it, it didn't. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in as meaningful a way as it perhaps should have. Mm -hmm. um, look, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist. You know, I think 9-11 was perpetrated by, you know, 19 guys with box cutters. But I do, you know, I'm not a truther, which I get criticized for from the far left all the time. But here's the deal. It goes beyond reasonable belief 
to think that no one in the Pakistani government or especially intelligence services realized that Osama bin Laden was living in plain sight about a mile from the gates of its version of West Point, okay, in a, in, in a major city, not, not, in the, not in a mountainous cave in the ungovernable border region between Pakistan and Afghanistan, as was surmised, but rather in a, a city outside of their military academy. Okay, so it, it 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 is to me outside the realm of possibility that there weren't at least some actors within the Pakistani government that were supporting this, right, or that were knowledgeable Absolutely. about this, no, protecting Bin Laden. No, there's no other possibility. Um, no, despite their denials, of course, and so one would have thought that post execution, you know, uh, raid on Osama bin Laden's lair, that the Obama and then the Trump administration would have you know, played a lot tougher with Pakistan. Um, but we really haven't, you know. Um, they, they still receive some version of American aid. Um, they're still a tacit ally in the war on terror. Um, I think it's because we're scared to death of them. Not, not scared of, like, Pakistan, you know, invading New York City, but afraid of the hair-trigger response of an Islamist-led uh, government over the nuclear arsenal, afraid that they'll ratchet up support for the Taliban or al-Qaeda, afraid that the state will just collapse, and therefore, you know, who knows who takes over Pakistan and it's, you know, 150 to 250 nuclear missiles. I think we're scared to death of Pakistan. We don't know what to do, you know, because a thinking administration, like them or not, a thinking administration like the Obama administration didn't really have a good answer. And if the Obama administration didn't have a good answer, I don't think you can expect some sort of rational strategic calculus from the Trump team. I mean, th- you know, these guys are unhinged, yeah. you know? I mean, they're, they're right once in a while about, like, pulling troops out of certain areas, but, you know, a fucking broken clock is right twice a day, too. So, I, I mean, it's, American Pakistan policy is an absolute muddled affair. It's a mess, and, uh, and I don't think that the think tanks on the left or the right, the mainstream tanks, I don't think they have Pakistan policy. I really don't, and I'm not you know, submitting that I have the answers. What I will tell you is it is shocking the degree to which Pakistan has not been held accountable for actions that if any other country did it, I mean, the the outcry would be phenomenal within the United States. But Pakistan sort of gets a pass, and I think it's because we're afraid of them and we're afraid of what might happen in that country. And well, we don't forget, be. we also have the, uh, the skeleton of that stealth Blackhawk. Who knows uh, how much bl- blackmail that uh, is worth. Stealth, stealth Blackhawk? Uh, uh, yeah, don't, that, that. don't you remember that, uh, the, the raid on the compound? Uh, one of oh, the, yeah, yeah, the one that got left there. Yeah, the one yeah, that they, they blew the in place. Stealth helicopter that had like a foot of blade on each... Uh, one of the wing tips. It looks absolutely ridiculous. Uh, yeah, that whole thing just blew my mind when we woke up the next morning and it was all done and they left a helicopter behind. And <laughs> yeah. I... The guys and I love doing the podcast. Being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us. But we can't do it all. We need you to share an episode of ours with somebody, anyone who you might think could be affected by it. Young people looking to join the military or parents advocating for one, conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name, advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment the military creates for minorities and the violence inflicted by some of those same minorities around the globe and anyone else you think it might affect. Please share this with them. But sharing our episodes is just one of the many ways you can support the podcast. In addition, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping BT, Danny, and I pay for some of the podcast expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of right now. So let's bring out our honorary producers, and they are 
Matthew Ho, Will Arenz, Gage Counts, Fahim Shirazi, Henry Zamoda, James Higgins, James Obar, Adam Bellows, and Eric Phillips. Your contributions are so helpful to us. Thank you all so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Teespring. The great Bill Kropinski did an amazing job helping us design our first t-shirt, which you can find at teespring.com forward slash stores forward slash Fortress on a Hill. And if you use the promo code militarism, you get free shipping. 22 bucks for an amazing t-shirt and you get to support the podcast. And speaking of that, let's get back to the podcast. So, a quick headline here about uh, the transgender troop community. Uh, the Supreme Court has allowed President Trump's ban on transgender individuals and U.S. military service to go into effect pending ongoing litigation. However, individuals who are currently serving that have, an already, that have already transitioned or have not begun their transition can remain in service. It's horrifically ironic to see Trump and the DOD push transgender members away um, while at the same time watching the DOD public affairs people tripping over themselves to make sure everyone knows that the U.S. military treats transgender military members with dignity and respect. Um, I've linked in the show notes to a recent hearing that was held on Capitol Hill where several current and former transgender service members testified to their value to military service. Um, please, please take a link to that. There's hours and hours of footage, but the, um, it's very much worth watching, uh, watching. Hopefully the, the current ongoing litigation will send this policy packing very much in the way that the courts did with, uh, don't ask, don't tell. All right. Um, I've got a couple things here about the government shutdown. Um, first there were some really serious delays that were caused in the Coast Guard's maintenance system um, from the New York Times, quote, internal documents obtained by the Times show that the Coast Guard's Ship Maintenance Command lost at least 7,456 productive work days or 28 and a half years worth of work, work days as a result of the partial shutdown, which furloughed 6,400 civilian employees. This reality poses significant risks to operational availability of cutters and boats, the documents concluded, the service also noted a domino effect that caused delays in repairs and maintenance on its roughly 200 aircraft, which in turn could keep them from being available. Um, given President Trump's huge push on security at the southern border, I wouldn't imagine this would be welcome news to him, except for the fact it's never been about border security. Oh, and, and speaking of being pissed off about the border, my old military police company, the 66 MP company, is currently deployed to the southern border. I, I'm sure they are down there laying as much sea wire as they can and, I don't know, teaching Spanish classes to uh, border guys that can't already speak it for some dumb reason. Now, I realize the, the impotence of the situation in front of me and any war activists finding buckets of anger at my former unit being sent to the border. But nonetheless, I think it's a horrible waste of manpower and resources. You know, first of all, what a shame that your unit's down there. What a shame that they're away from their families for, yes. a, non, uh, for an unnecessary deployment, for a non-emergency emergency. Because that's what this is. Yep. This national emergency is a non-emergency. I mean, immigration is down. Uh, crime among illegals is, uh, I hate that word illegals, crime among un undocumented is, 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 is actually lower per capita than among American citizens. You know, most of the, uh, many of the people who are here illegally overstay their visas or come through major ports of entry rather than across the Sonoran Desert. I mean, all of this speaks to this being a non-emergency. What's fascinating is what you said, which is that if, if, drugs and some of the more nefarious illegal actors or undocumented actors are coming through via the sea, 
through ports of entry, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Isn't it ironic that the president was willing to shut down the government, including the Coast Guard, uh, in order to get his wall, right? Because, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, you know, the Coast Guard's not getting paid during the last shutdown. And, you know, um, they do a huge service to the country in, in relation to counter drug, you know, and also to some extent, maritime border security so look this this is about politics this is politics this isn't strategy this isn't policy i mean if it was policy then the stats that i began this little rant with would matter but we're in a post-factual environment this is fear mongering children are in cages not because there's a legitimate national emergency but because the president knows that scapegoating brown people helps him win elections with his base. And I'm not afraid to say that shit anymore because I can. And it's true. And it's fucking horrifying. It really is. It, it really, really is. Um, and, and he continually passes over, I'm sure it's intentional, the idea that our borders are everywhere. Airports, uh, boat, boat crossings, you know, that the, the real places where a suspected terrorist might come through generally aren't at the southern border. It, 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 it just doesn't happen very often. Why would you want to try? You know, just hearing about the, the maintenance thing, and as much as I uh, got upset over the whole Tyndall Air Force Base, the, the maintenance wasn't even something that came to my mind during the Coast Guard shutdown. But I, I, remember, I had 24 aircraft that I was responsible for when I was in a, a maintenance company. And we were working during, this was deployment, so we were flying the, the crap out of our aircraft, but I mean, I was working 14, 16 hours a day, working four or five aircraft at a time, and just trying to juggle this insane amount of logistics that had to be uh, taken care of, and trying to think about having all of that shut down, and then having to step back in that first day that you get paid again, and you're like, how am I supposed to knock out 200, whatever it was, years worth of maintenance that was probably barely being able to be maintained to begin with, all of this in light of the, the ProPublica's article on the U.S. Navy and the USS Fitzgerald and the John McCain and all of the disasters that went about that, one of the understated issues in those stories is when the Fitzgerald was sent out, it was supposed to be doing maintenance runs. It wasn't supposed to be going out into operation, but they changed that maintenance run. And the the ship was going out there with systems that were not operating properly, being expected to perform their job. There is a huge issue in the military mm-hmm. when it comes to the reality of maintenance has to get done and people are pretending like that is something that can just be swept aside when it is a 24 hour process that goes into maintaining mission readiness. You can't just stop this and you can't, at some point you overburden the system and you see all of these breakdowns. And now we're putting people's lives at risk on top of all of the other risks that naturally come with being a service member or being in the Coast Guard. These are all issues that are being created that are not necessary. No, it's been a it it's been a constant thing, you know, when, when there's when there's budget cuts to be made because of the huge contracts that people that DOD has with the military industrial complex, it means that they're like, Well we'll still spend the money to the contracts, but the trainers and the maintainers, the sixty four hundred guys that I mentioned that were furloughed, they're not around. And so the people that are most important to help people in service and even do the actual work because there's some work that people, you know, service members don't even do because it's that sophisticated. Yeah, it it just fucking blows my mind. All right, so next on the shutdown list, the quarterly SIGAR report, SIGAR standing for Special Inspector General on Afghan Reconstruction, has been cut down significantly due to the shutdown. Um, says a quote, and this is, this is from the State Department. Due to the partial government shutdown and the furlough of staff at the Department of State and the U.S. Agency 
for inter international development. This report does not contain sections on governance and civil society, humanitarian assistance and development, and stabilization and infrastructure. You would think with the situation in Afghanistan right now, those would be the most important sections. But again, like what you were just talking about, BT, is that it just, they, they attempt to pretend that it's okay that they keep going. They attempt to pretend that it's okay to send the Fitzgerald that's not fit for duty out to do actual operations. They just, it's okay, it's no big deal that we cut out this super fucking important part of the report that's always there that's mandated by law. So. And, and the thing is, <laughs> CIGAR is like a really important report, okay? It's like, like their reports are really important. I think they're quarterly, and they've been telling us for like the five or six years that they've been mandated by Congress, what they've told us every fucking quarter is the war is failing and it's getting worse. Over and over again, they tell us the same thing. And it's like nobody's listening. But ironically enough, as Trump gets ready to try to pull out of Afghanistan, or at least as he ostensibly appears to be, you know, wanting to pull out of Afghanistan, reports in some ways should be funded because they're his best friends. Because they make the argument you know, in a very rational, logical, organized fashion, that the war in Afghanistan is, is failing. In fact, they've argued essentially that it's already over, that, that, that it's beyond, it's past the point of no return. The, you know, these, cutting these uh, sorts of reports to the bone during a shutdown is a big deal. Look, your average American doesn't read the Seagar report, but I wish that the executive summary of those reports, which is pretty long in and of itself, was mandatory reading for like every school kid in high school because it would get us out of Afghanistan so much faster if the average American, okay, knew the truth and could contact their congressman after having read one of these reports or at least the summaries. Um, and I have one more, one more, I was going to say a little headline. It's not little at all, but one more headline attached to the war in Afghanistan and it, that the war killed a record number of civilians in 2018. The casualties included 3,804 deaths and 7,189 injuries in fighting between the Afghan government, a U.S.-led coalition of military forces, the Taliban, the Afghan branch of ISIS, and other unidentified militias. More than 32,000 civilians have been killed in Afghanistan in the last decade. That's just since 2009. That's around 10, 10 9-11s for those looking at the math. And that's just deaths in Afghanistan. Um, yeah, but everyone knows that brown Afghan Muslim civilians aren't as important as American or even European civilians, right? Isn't, th isn't that the rule? Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, however you treat the least of my people, as long as they're not brown and Muslim, yep. is how you treat me. That's what, the, that's what the Bible said, right? In Matthew, I believe? Yeah. yeah. Garland said it. He said, if your country's got brown people, we'll tell them to watch the fuck out. We'll bum them. If your country is full of brown people... Oh, we like that, don't we? That's our hobby. That's our new job in the world, bombing brown people. Iraq, Panama, Grenada, Libya, you got some brown people in your country. Tell them to watch the fuck out or we'll goddamn bomb them. Well, when's the last white people you can remember that we bombed? Can you remember the last white? Can you remember any white people we've ever bombed? The Germans, those are the only ones. And that's only because they were trying to cut in on our action. They wanted to dominate the world. Bullshit. That's our fucking job. That's our... Yeah, he did. Oh, the world is so much worse without George Carlin in it. Yeah, I miss that, man. Yeah, so ever so briefly, I want to touch on one of my favorite subjects for those of you who follow my writing, which is Israel-Palestine and the incredible just American favoritism for Israel, the one-sided nature of our you know, involvement in the purported, you know, what used to be called the peace process, which no one even tries for peace in Palestine anymore. Uh, well, the UN, the United Nations Human Rights Council, again, re you know, released a report that again tells us what we already knew, which is that the Israeli military is overly harsh and committing war crimes. Um, this one, this report refers specifically to last year's, and, and they're ongoing, but especially last year's mostly peaceful Palestinian protests along the Gaza border wall. Um, they are protesting for the right of people to return to their former homes from refugee camps. They are 
uh, protesting to end the blockade that is literally putting a stranglehold on Gaza and creating what one British politician called uh, the largest open air prison in the world. You know, and, and, and among other things, they're, they're, you know, they're protesting against Israeli settlements, which are illegal. They're protesting against the Israeli occupation of the West Bank, which is illegal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the UN uh, Human Rights Report found that uh, the, the Israeli military uh, may well have committed war crimes. They shot, six, shot and wounded 6,000 Palestinian, almost all unarmed protesters, and they, and they killed about 135 of them including 35 uh, children and a number of journalists. In fact, the most da- damning parts of the report, which I've only read the summary, but it's pretty lengthy, uh, all, uh, that uh, they may have targeted journalists and targeted civilians, and in a few instances even targeted children. Um, look, one way to understand whether a crime has been committed or whether there was too heavy-handed or too militarist of a response is to look at proportionality. And proportionality is very important in international uh, law, especially in international military law. And 130 to 135 Palestinian civilian protesters were, were, were killed, were, were, were murdered along the border, and a total of two Israeli soldiers were killed, and, and only one of those was even at the border. The other one was involved in a whole separate operation. So this is very lopsided which doesn't mean in and of itself the Israelis were wrong, but it does raise some questions, right? It doesn't pass the smell test. Okay, there's a lot of, there's a lot of smoke there, and, and the report found that there was indeed fire. Um, will President Trump and his administration, or, or even would a President Clinton, if she had won, uh, do anything to change America's relationship with Israel? No. The answer is naturally no. Um, the American government the bipartisan mainstream consensus from left to right, Democrat and Republican, is beholden to the Israel lobby and to the Israeli right-wing government's interests. And that has been the case since uh, at least 1967, and it's only gotten worse year after year. Because to criticize Israel, to say, hey, maybe they shouldn't have killed 135 civilians along the border who were protesting and maybe they shouldn't have shot 6,000 others, you know, to say that opens you up to charges of anti-Semitism. Well, they say, you know, what they'll say is if you criticize Israel, you're criticizing Jews worldwide, but that's not true. And we have to stop being scared of that. We have to stop being scared of being labeled as anti-Semite because those of us who criticize Israel, okay, in cogent well thought out ways. We know we're not anti semites We know it's not about that, and we got to be less and less afraid of those who would label us as such. This is not the first, and it will not be the last UN Human Rights Council report that calls the Israeli response or Israeli militarism or the Israeli occupation uh, to be illegal or to be a war crime. Um, In the United States, we're not even allowed to have this debate. One of the first things that the new Senate passed was a massive violation of the First Amendment, which was the anti-BDS legislation. BDS is an international anti-occupation, anti-Israeli occupation movement that uh, stands for boycott, divest, and sanction. It essentially follows the international model of the response to South African apartheid, where most of the world, except for America and Israel, most of the world uh, sanctioned and isolated South Africa until they agreed to one man, one vote, and agreed to allow black power and eventually Nelson Mandela to be president. Um, There are a lot of differences, but there's also a lot of similarities between apartheid South Africa and what I would consider apartheid Israel. And, you know, I think it's important we have that discussion. But even if you disagree with me on Israel, certainly we should be able to agree that I have the right to question these things, that the BDS movement has the right to take action in its private sphere. But in the United States, free speech only applies so long as you're not talking about Israel. And that is scary. That is scary. Because the truth of the matter is, America's lopsided, one-sided support for Israel is making us less safe. I can't tell you how many Baghdad living rooms and how many Kandahar novels I went into where these 
illiterate, usually citizens, had a, a major, you know, a large picture of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem on their wall. They care about Jerusalem. They care about the way the Palestinians are treated. They care about the plight of the Palestinian people. And it makes them angry with the U.S. It doesn't just make them angry with U.S. policy. It makes them angry with all Americans. And it's a recruiting boon for the Islamists. And so, look, this alliance with Israel is uh, it's, it's at a point of diminishing returns. Now, none of this is to say that Israel doesn't have a right to exist. It does. And it doesn't mean that Israel doesn't have a right to security. It does. It just means that Israel has to comply with international law like everybody else. There can't be two standards. There can't be one standard of international law for everybody else and then another standard of international law for the United States and its friends, the Israelis. It's like Israel's like a protected class. They get a whole separate set of rules, and uh, it has to stop. Uh, so suffice it to say, this report um, was damning, and it was shocking even uh, for this relatively numbed soul uh, that's speaking right now. The... Uh while you've been gone, Danny, the Twitter sphere has been full of bullshit about Representative Ilhan Omar. She has been making some truthful uh, ob observations about APAC and other things on Twitter. She uh, quoted a, a P. Diddy song saying it's all about the Benjamins in reference to APAC. And then it starts, everybody, the whole thing gets started flooding with the words anti-Semitic tropes. And that's the, that's, the, that's the shield that all the politicians use, is that you can't be using these anti-Semitic tropes. Well, how do you talk about money in Israel then, if, if that is considered one of them? It's not, but that's the, that's the connection they're attempting to make for people. But the ugliness that involved Rep. Omar definitely had to do with the fact that she's Muslim. It, it, it wouldn't have continued nearly as long with her being browbeaten by everyone, including Nancy Pelosi, forcing her to give some kind of a, a ham-fisted apology about it. Um, just so within the party, within the Democratic establishment, that there's some kind of parody. And it, it fucking blows a hole in my head. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Totally agree. I've been following that story since I got back, um, and it, it shows that this is a bipartisan consensus. This 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 wildly pro-Israel, this 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 Israel apologism. I mean, it, it's as strong in the Democratic Party among the Pelosi's and the Spenny Hoyers of the world as it is among the Mitch McConnells and the Paul Ryan's of the Republican world. I mean, it's it's scary. I mean, her freedom of speech is also being you know. Uh, you know, limited to a certain extent. And nothing she said and nothing she tweeted was overtly anti-Semitic. No. And nothing that she tweeted or nothing she said was even untrue. The power of the Israel lobby is extraordinary in Washington. And if, and if nothing proves that more than the response of her detractors. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's just, it's just been ugly. And I'm, I'm at least grateful there's a community of people that recognizes it for the ugliness that it has. Um, we had a, uh, a question from Linda um, on that exact subject. Linda, I hope that answers it. I think we covered everything in your question, but if we happen to miss something, please, uh, please send, me a, send me an email. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes www.fortressonahill.com iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. Come all you good people and listen to my song. I hope you'll pay attention. I will not